All right, so we're, we are going to begin. And um, I am here to introduce Chuck Feldman, who is the president of the Holocaust Awareness Museum and Education Center in Philadelphia. And he will introduce David Tuck. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, uh, well, you're in for a treat today. You know, you don't talk about Holocaust and treat necessarily in the same sentence, but this gentleman, Dave Tuck, does close to 100 programs with school students every year. Our organization founded um, almost 60 years ago by a gentleman by the name of Yaakov Riz, who was a survivor of a Soviet labor camp. When he was in that labor camp, he made a promise to God that if he survived, he would tell the world about the Holocaust and especially young people. And that is our mission. And we now have over 20 survivors working with us. And we do over 300 programs every year, most of them in the five county area, although Dave will tell you we have traveled to Kane University in North Jersey. We have traveled to Scranton, Western Pennsylvania, Delaware. And um, our mission is to provide living testimony. When we stand, when the facilitators stand before the kids, we say something like, you know, wouldn't it be great if you could talk with George Washington or Abraham Lincoln or... Uh, Martin Luther King or Rosa Parks, you can't. They're not with us anymore. But Dave Tuck is here today to provide his eyewitness testimony as to what happens when hatred runs amok. And that's what we do. And we do it once the school year starts, almost on a daily basis. We do over 300 programs every year. We reach close to 40,000 kids every year. And now with Skype, uh, Dave, for example, has Skyped within the last year to places as close as Western Canada and as far away as Sweden and Australia. And what uh, I would like to convey to you is, as teachers uh, in a state like New Jersey that has uh, mandated Holocaust education, that this is a very important mission. It's a very important mission because if there are Holocaust deniers today, when there are thousands of Holocaust survivors walking among us, what about the future? Um, and so without further ado, we're going to uh, show you a little bit about Dave's life, and then Dave will uh, tell you his story. And we'll be here for questions afterwards. Okay, so... Now, you want to... This one? The slides. Yes, yeah, so I'm just going to put the mic oh, back for fine. him and... Get him settled, and then I will be in charge of no, this. No, he's reading them. I don't yeah, know. I'm going to read the slides. Oh, reading. you're reading the slides. Yeah, oh, excuse me. Excuse That's okay. Me. You tell me what to do. We, we, we haven't fully rehearsed. All right, we did not have a rehearsal. <laughs> okay. All right, you just tell me. Yeah, go. Go. Yeah, I'll not nod my head. Okay. Okay, um, this is the um, August 15th, 1935 Nazi rally, proclaiming that the Jewish question was far from settled. Okay. This is Austria, uh, a boy writes Jew on a storefront window after the Anschluss. Polish Jews being rounded up for deportation. Um, 3.2 million out of the 3.4 million Polish Jews were murdered. Dave was from Poland. Half of the German Jews survived. Why? They could see it coming. The footbridge in the large ghetto. These all pertain to Dave's past. And a sign at the footbridge Jewish residential district, entrance forbidden. This is a Jewish doctor's visit in the ghetto. And from the Terezin ghetto, until after a long time I'd be well again, then I'd like to live and go back home again. Terezin was a propaganda camp that was set up by the Nazis where conditions weren't nearly as harsh and when they let the Red Cross, the International Red Cross, come, see, we're not doing anything terrible. The Einsatz group and victims stripping their clothes off. The old and sick Jews from the Lodz ghetto selected for deportation to the Chelmno extermination camp. Five of the six extermination camps were in Poland. 
These are Jewish resistors in 1943 rounded up after the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. Interestingly, that young boy survived and died only about seven or eight years ago. These are the infamous cattle cars where people were taken to the extermination camps. Captured Jewish resistance fighters. The most famous, probably, uh, Arbeit macht frei, work will set you free, the front gate of Auschwitz that Dave saw. Um, a bigger lie was never told. The Auschwitz selections to the left, the gas chambers to the right, slave labor. This is the actual number that Dave received at Auschwitz, his tattoo. One of the myths about the Holocaust is that all Holocaust survivors have tattoos. In fact, it was only at Auschwitz and only for a couple of years that people were tattooed. This in Auschwitz, Jewish women and children awaiting instructions at the train platform. Barracks conditions at Buchenwald, another of the infamous extermination camps. Maidanic crematory upon liberation, 1944. Children showing their tattoos to Soviet liberators at Auschwitz. These, these are slave laborers at a granite mine in Matthausen, Austria. Dave was also there. The entrance to Bergkristall, the underground Messerschmitt jet plane factory at Gusen II. This is a liberation photo. Probably one of the most famous photos from World War II, General Eisenhower with General Bradley and Patton surveying dead prisoners. Eisenhower prophetically said, we have to take these pictures because there will come a time when people will say that this never happened. These are SS women forced to throw the dead and emaciated into communal graves. This is one of those communal graves. Emaciated and sick survivors from Voblin and Ebensee. The infamous Nuremberg trials, 1945, where 24 leaders of the Nazi military, political, and economic sectors were accused of war crimes. Dave Talk. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm going to tell you today, I don't believe it myself. I'm talking to you. I was born in Poland, lived close to the German border. I speak the language. Population of Poland was 34 million. 10% of the population were Jewish, 3 million 400,000. 3 million 200,000 didn't make it back. First, the Nazis gave us yellow armband to wear on the left arm. Then they gave us Star of David, one at the front, one at the back. If you walked on a sidewalk and you saw the assessment, you know, the guys assessing the next, if you didn't step down, they kill you. And then, in our time, we only had 18 Jewish families. But closer to the German border, there wasn't too many Jews living there. Time went by. Our town was only 18 Jewish families. Almost a year went by, and one day, they told us an order. Get together as much as you can. You're going to go to a ghetto. We got together as much as we could. And from all the town close to us, we had 164 adults and children. And they took us to a ghetto. You remember, the, you saw a picture with the ghetto with the bridge, Lodge? This was the first ghetto. We got there to the ghetto. They gave us a home where to live. The ghetto was open at that time. And then they said, organize your own government, because they were closing up the ghetto. They started bringing in people from all over. I was there, 
there was an order from the people ready for organ the Jewish people organized the ghetto. All men and boys, anybody speaks German, come over, sign up. I went there with my father. The guy looked at me. He said, how old are you? I said, I'm in December, I'm going to be 10 years old. He said, 15. Now, why did he say 15? Can anybody tell me? And you're going to be a mechanic from now on. 15, because at 10, I have no right to live, because I can't produce nothing, I can't work. And almost a year went by, I was working in the office, giving out ration cards. I had to do something. And then, all men and boys sign up, you're going to go to work. My father and I, we signed up, and they're sending us into a big city, Posen, to a camp. It was the Posen Stadium. If you look it up in books, you can find but the stadium in Posen. You wouldn't believe it, what was going on there. There's a big write-up of them. They put us in the, in the stadium. They put us bunk beds. You saw the bunk beds. We were lucky we had some straw. Did you notice something over there? Something was missing. Pillows. We used to use the plate we used to get the soup from. This was our pillow. And I was lucky I had some straw in a blanket. First, we got to get it. There were a total of us of 911 adult boys. I waited in line. My first number was 176. For them, it was easier to give the numbers than to give names. Because if they give us names, most of the Jews have German names, less names. So we gave us the number, 176, and they put us to work. Building the Autobahn. Anybody know what the Autobahn is? Turnpike. From Berlin to Moscow. First, every morning we used to wake up at 4 o'clock. There wasn't no showers. We went and washed ourselves as much as we could. Then I waited in line. Now pay attention, what I'm going to say now. I got a slice of bread in the morning and a slice of bread in the evening and a soup in the daytime. The soup, if you find a potato or anything else, you were lucky. And with this, I lived for four and a half years. Lived, survived, and suffered. But I had to go to work, building the Autobahn. They put me with another guy together, I was with my father to get it. I was not, I don't know what my father got in the ghetto, but I was supposed to be a mechanic. All of them, I think we said it. I saw my father only once. We were in the same camp. And they put out to work with another guy loading up dirt for the turnpike. A couple of weeks later, I noticed that the foreman got himself a trailer. You know what chutzpah mean? It's a Hebrew word, guts. It's a boy, I didn't care, I didn't understand those things. I knocked at the door. He opened the door, he said, what do you want? I said, can I do something for you? In German, everything. He said, I said, yes. What can you do for me? I said, make your bed in the morning, polish your boots, bring your food from the kitchen, and for me, the most important thing, I didn't care about his polishing boots and thing. I go to the kitchen, maybe I'm going to pick up some extra food. I went to the kitchen, he said, good, work with me. Well, I don't know what he was in the home, he was, must be somebody that he didn't know what he was doing. Now when I brought, I went to the kitchen, I said, come on, give me something extra. They didn't give it to me. They were also survivors, and we survived prisoners, but then, I don't know, there was an order or something. When I brought him to breakfast or lunch, I was waiting for him. And he played a game with me. 
he threw his leftovers in the trash can. What did I do? I went over to the trash can, picked up his plate, put all the pieces what were there left over, and I ate it. And he was laughing. I said to myself, well, you may laugh, me that my extra piece of bread. This was going on for months. Months was going on. And then people start dying. There were sicknesses, there were typhoid. I was sick, I knew it. The one night when I went to sleep, I asked God, please let me see the light the next day. I thought every day is the last day. And a year went by. Then people were dying all over. Then I went back to work again. And almost two years went by. I'm losing weight. I'm at skin and bone. And then they're closing up. The camp imposing closing up. Almost after two years. They put us in a passenger train. Now, why did it? You see, a lot of people, you saw them, they're loading them up in kettle cars, right? Now, why passenger train? You may be supposed to be mechanics. Now they have a factory for us. I'm going to build the big guns. I don't know. Anybody knows. And the veterans know. 88 millimeter guns. They were the guns were shooting down planes and tanks. And they did this kind of work. I went there. With the train, passenger train, I wind up in Birkenau. You ever heard of Birkenau? When you went to Auschwitz, the train came through to Auschwitz. Then it went further down a little bit, Birkenau. Maybe you saw a sign, a scene before, the men separate, the women separate on one side. I saw it. Maybe I didn't see this one, but I saw it. I didn't know. I never knew what the Auschwitz exists. Because in the camp, we had no connection with the world. I waited, they got off, music is playing. The woman kissed one side, the men on the other side. They didn't know what's going to happen. They thought they were going to take a shower. Now, the people live around there, they said they never knew about it. You can smell the odor. I didn't know what was going on. From there, they put us on trucks. And five minutes later, I was in front of those gates. Albert McFry, I said, well, it's not too bad if you work. The only way to be free is to die. I went to Auschwitz. They gave us special uniforms. I waited in line. Because there were a lot of people were there from the camps. I got there, a guy is sitting, an assessment is sitting over there, and he looks at me, and he says, are you against Hitler? I got scared, I said, no. Then he got up, he got mad, I thought he was going to take and kill me. But then I said, the best of you, you're Jewish. I said, yeah, it's been a year, but I'm Jewish, but I'm not against Hitler. Then he got mad, and he said, get out. I, I can see it now. I went out, opened the door. When I opened the door, I saw people, thousands of people, walking around in blue and white stripes. You ever saw the blue and white striped uniform? Only Auschwitz had him. No other camp. Everybody was wearing civilians. Auschwitz had those. From every country in Europe, there were people there. Not only Jewish. Every country, everybody there. Every nationality. First they gave me a haircut. They cut a strip in the middle. Then they gave me a tattoo. I still have it. I'm looking now at people. They're getting tattoos all over the bodies. This was hurting. They had a pen with a needle and punched holes in it. 
make points, let the ink soak in. I don't know how people do it now, but it was hurting. I got the number, 141631, and I still have it. And then the first time they gave me my stripe uniform, everything was the same. Four o'clock in the morning, everything the same. But it's the first time I saw a civilian, engineers. Now I'm going to build those big guns. Engineer walked over and he says, it's the first time I saw a civilian. What number you have for Auschwitz? And I told him 141631. He looked up, he said, you're a machine mechanic. So in the ghetto, I don't know if they put a machine, I don't know. I said, yes. But he said, all the machines are taken. He took me over to a table like this, a little bit bigger. There was a black laying there. I don't know if anybody knows there's a black from the gun. When you, when you close up, put the bullet in, that's the black. He said, file it down. I said, I file it down. I'm a skin and bone. I have no time. I start filing. Nothing was coming off. I said, I'm in trouble. And then I noticed there's an office not too far away on the glass, somebody sitting by himself, and they said the control room. So all the parts came to check first in this office. And again, as a boy, I didn't understood better. I had the guts to go over there, knock at the door. He called me in, and I started talking to him. I'm a mechanic. I speak your language. Can I help you? He said, good. Then he said, you know something? You were lucky. The God, you had no right to come over here. The God, if the God saw you, they will kill you. What the guy did, every morning, and every lunchtime, he brought me bread, anything, sometimes a little bit, anything extra, marmalade, jam, anything. He wrapped it on a piece of paper, threw it in the trash can. Then he got up, turned the other way, looked through the window, with the back top me, and I know already that the bread is over there in the basket. I went there, I put it behind my shirt, and I was nibbling on it, like I used to do before. When I got hungry, slice of bread, how long does it last? When I put it behind, when I got hungry, I took a bite of it, put it back. One time, a month went by, every month, every lunchtime, I got food from him. Every little bit it helped. One day, I took the slice of bread, I don't know why I did it, and I put it in the drawer. Ten minutes later, somebody hit me from the back, I wind up on the floor and I got up as quick as possible. I saw boots, I knew it the SS. He was watching it. He must have sold something. He says, open the drawer. When he said, open the drawer, I said, God, this is it. He said, where did you get this? Not this, bread was white. The bread what I was getting was brown. I don't know until today what they were making for. I said I got it from a Czechoslovakian. He knew better. Now, why did I say Czechoslovakian? I was getting two cigarettes every Sunday. I didn't smoke and I still don't smoke. There were people in this camp that were getting packages to the Red Cross. They must have connection because usually they wouldn't give it. But they needed people to work then. They'd be building guns, we're fighting. I told him, he didn't believe me, right? He saw it, what's happening. Six o'clock, leave the factory. Then they call my number to the front. I got to the front, they put me behind electric wires. And then I waited till nine o'clock. No food, no nothing. They're closing up at nine o'clock, the camp every night. I wake up in the morning, wash myself. I waited in line. They said, go back to the front. Now I don't have nothing at night and nothing in the, in the morning. Put me behind electric wires again. And I waited till 8 o'clock. Everybody went to work. And then a guy walks in 9 o'clock. On my 8 o'clock. 
opens the gate, he said, come on, with a machine gun. What do you think I thought? I always said, God, this is it. He took me outside the camp. When he took me outside the camp, I thought they're going to kill me. He took me to the commander's office. I never forget it. I can see it now. I opened the door. I walked in. And the guy's assessment is sitting there and looking down at them. And guess what I did? I had the guts again. Commander, I have to go back to work. I will work in the control room. They need those guns for our fight for the country. He looked at me. He got laughing. I told him to take a gun and just kill me. And I will forget those words. Go back to work. Work for our country. Next time if I see you here, I hang you upside down. And me, as a boy, I said thank you. I told Danke Shay, I will thank you very much. Commander, I walked out. At that time when I walked out, I said to myself, David, don't give up. The American landed already. They're almost getting closer. They're bombing all over. And they're closing up Auschwitz. i never forget this day, January the 13th, 45. This is four and a half years already. I'm skin and bone. I'm glad they can still walk and talk. And that there's a roll call. The roll call, and then the country put us in the cattle cars. What they did, they put three guns on the same train. Now we're going to go to another camp. I don't know if you saw it in the end. In the, there was in the mountain an entrance, maybe two holes in the mountain over there. That's the camp. I was working there. Now I'm going to build planes. But I didn't know what's going to happen. They put us in cattle cars. And they put three guns on the same train. And we start traveling. Why did they put the train? The guns. They figure if the American or the Russian got a bomb, they're going to, then they're going to kill us. From Auschwitz to go to Linz, Austria. You ever heard of a camp Matthausen? I love the godforsaken camp. They put in piling as many people they could, no way to wash, no, no toilets, no nothing. What happened? The American bombed the railroad tracks and the roads. So let's say we traveled 20 miles, we had to go 20 miles back and back, back and forth. Normally it would take maybe four or five hours to go to Austria. It took us five and a half days. People were dying. The smell and the odor was terrible. They'd be wide up in this godforsaken Mauthausen. They have no place for us. But the first thing that were afraid for diseases, they told us to wash ourselves. We washed ourselves. And never forget, this is January. It's cold. It's in the mountain there. They left my shoes. I don't think they were my shoes in. They left a belt and a little cup, stripped naked, put us outside. They said, you wait till we have a place for you. Thousands of us walked around, naked, stripped naked. We were rubbing each back, everybody, just to be something warm. Then they called us in, put us on the floor, woke up in the morning, told us to wash ourselves, gave us some food. They put us on the train again. We wind up to another camp, losing two. You maybe you saw this one, the mountain. <coughs> this was trouble. Because this was coming to an end already. But I used to walk to the American and the Russian were bombing all over. They bombed this place over there, but in the mountain, those bombs didn't go through the mountain. They, would, they hit everything outside. And then I used to go back from work to the camp. I picked up grass, I picked up leaves, anything I could find. Went to the camp, put some water, and I ate the soup, like a soup. The water, the grass, and everything. 
in May the 5th, 1945, I always remember that I always said that's my birthday. I was born again. There's a roll call. <clears throat> Machine guns all over. They always had roll calls. If you couldn't work, they'd kill you. I was glad I could still walk and talk. And the guy said, there were more dead people in the camp laying in the barrack. They didn't have place where to put him because the American and the Russian were ch chasing them all over. When I saw the machine guns, I said, they're going to kill us. The guy said, Ass assessment, go back to work, go back to the barrack. Anybody walks off in the barrack, gets killed. He said, 11 o'clock, 11, 12, lunchtime, the American going to come down the mountain in tanks and you're going to be free. Go back to the barracks. I was glad to tell you the truth. I can still walk and talk. I was skinny bone. I got back to the barrack and I was laying in the barrack and I hear people screaming and hollering and shooting. We had a lot of people from Yugoslavia in Czechoslovakia and all those countries around. They came in 1944. I was there already for four years. They could run around do help. Then the American came. Be free. Now they said to us, we're going to give you food. Don't overeat. If you're going to overeat, you're going to die. Picture this. I get a box with food. White bread the first time I see it. I see jam. I see butter. I see every little thing. And I said to myself, they told me if I eat it, I'm going to die. And if I'm not going to eat, I'm going to die too. Might as well I eat. Would you believe it? I put some bread, put some marmalade, anything I could put it on. I took a bite and I rested. I was scared to eat a lot. I was taking a bite. I ate it. And then, three days they didn't let us out. No, open the camp. They were afraid for diseases. They were right. No diseases. Now they opened an office. I, I went there. I said, I want to go back to America. I want to go to America. When I was a little boy, I heard everybody goes to America. He said, where were you born? I said, in Poland. In Poland is a quota. I didn't know what a quota meant at the time. He explained to me what a quota meant. And then he said, if you find somebody who sponsors you, I said, what is a sponsor? He told me that somebody's giving you a job. You can't go not to work here. You have to go to work. How can you get a sponsor right away? You have to know. And he said, if you want it, you can stay in camp. It's going to be, now it's going to be a camp, food, everything. If you want, you can go back to Germany. All the camps are now, camps open for the people to survive. Would you believe it? I was there until 1950. People were still in the camp living, had families and everything. I just wanted to get out of it, and they were living there, had families. And he said, if you want to stay here or you want to go to Italy, I said, let me go to Italy. I didn't want to go back to Poland and wait. I was skinny bone. I was 15 years old. I weighed 78 pounds. Doctors took care of me. Little by little, I gained weight. But nine months later, I was a human being already. And the boys and the girls said, there were a lot of people there living there. The outside Milan was it. Now, I, I mean, all those things, I became an Italian. And a bunch of guys and girls said, let's go to Paris, France. I said, hey, no visa, no nothing. You have just papers. That's all. We went to Paris. I went to Paris, and I right away asked any Jewish organization. They said yes. I went there, and I told the story. He said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to stay in Paris now. He said, good, but you have to go to work. You can't live here because if you're not going to do it, the government going to let you because you're going to do How are you going to survive? Black market? You know, that black market was open over there at that time. We did business. In Italy, I do business with, with the English 
with every, everything, but with just to survive. And he said, give me some less names. Do you have family here? I said, no, I don't know. I gave him four less names, mostly popular Jewish less names. Almost two years went by. Calls me up. He said, a lady wants to talk to you. I met a lady in the office. We were sitting maybe 10, 15 minutes. And she was thinking, marking down. She said, I think I'm the second cousin from your father's side. I said to myself, I don't care for what side. I'm going to go. I wanted to go. And then she said to me, you know something? Why don't you come with me to my place, my apartment? I'm going to have a decent meal. I went with her. Then she, meantime, she made a phone call. I didn't know what. And a young girl walks in. And she introduced her. Said, that's Marie. And she was in a camp two for three and a half years working in a factory making cloth for the army. Then she explained to me I'm the survivor. And I told him I'm going... To Excuse me. I'm going to America. I'm waiting for my papers. And then I have a lot of, how you say it, chutzpah in French? It's, it's Hebrew. I said, Marie, why don't you come with me to America? She said, David, I have a family here. She had a big family, a surviving friend. And then we start going out dating, you know, and then I said to him, Marie, the papers came. I'm going to America. Why don't you come with me? Uh, she said, I don't know. I said, if you come, we have to get married. And guess what? She said, I'm going. Be but we had to get married. Because I'm not she has to wait another six, eight years. We got married. We came to the state in 1950. I spoke four languages. I don't speak English. For one person, does anybody know who came up with the spelling? <laughs> who invented spelling? <laughs> and then they told me, I went to a, a symposium, later years, right? Professors only. He said, you're doing pretty good, but you have an accent. I said, I never had an accent and came up until I came to America. <laughs> now if they ask me what accent, what do you think I'm telling you? I'm Pennsylvania Dutch. <laughs> and then we had a daughter. I worked for two years in a factory. It was making a dollar an hour at that time. They told me it's a lot of money. I have a family now. I have one daughter three grandchildren, and nine great-great-grandchildren. How can you remember all of them? My grandson gave the boys, all four boys, guess what? Each name starts with a C. I looked in the Bible. I don't find nobody with a C. <laughs> I said, well, where did you pick those names? He said, Grandpa. Those are hockey players football players and all those things. I said, my God. <laughs> it's a different life. One thing. I'm going to say now what I'm t saying in school when I talk to the students. I go to middle school, high school, college, university. I go all over. I go to, even to junior prisons. That's what I'm telling the kids. If somebody bullies you, don't answer, don't say nothing, just walk away. It's their problem, not yours. And I tell him, I have a number in my arm. I will never forget and never forgive. But I don't live with hate. I have a lot of people don't understand. Hate? God said you should forgive hate. I said, I don't, God is going to forgive me this time. But I tell him, if somebody bothers you, walk away. It's their problem. They have a problem. They want to be over you something. Ask the teachers. If the teacher doesn't have, ask the, your parents. Once in a while, talk to them, to the parents. I tell them. Because the kids now are different than they used to be, we used to be. And I also tell them, stay in school with educated. 
In education, you can be anything you want to do. Do the best you can. If you can make it to universities, go to tech school. You can make a good living. Somebody has to build America. They're always going to need the electrician and all those things. That's what I'm talking to them. But don't live with hate. If I have to look at my number every day and dwell on it, I'm going to bring back memories, right? Who's going to suffer? Me. That's what I'm telling the students. Don't do it. Let them have the problems. I even go to junior prison and talk to the prisoners there. That's what I'm talking to the kids. The most important for you is education. And with education, you can be anything you wanted to. So ladies and gentlemen, I talked enough today. I'm doing this every day. I'm booked till next, <laughs> a, next April. I go to our Skype, I do all over, and uh, the best I can. Do me a favor, please. If you ask any question you wanted to, don't, you can ask anything you wanted to. That's what I always tell the teachers, please. Tell the, but I supposed to come, ask the kids to sign on, ask question. Without question, they're, they're, sometimes they're bashful. Sometimes they talk. And you know, something is funny. When I go to middle school, what younger the kids are, what more questions they ask. I give you something what happened to me. I go to one school, a middle school, 12 years. 12 years already. This year, they came back from Washington for the Holocaust Museum. And he said, David, sit over here, there, wait until they're set up, because you'd sit over there until they pile in. Over, almost over 500 kids. I walk in, everybody's quiet, nice, sitting. I said, something isn't right. <laughs> and the guy started introducing it all over the thing. And they said, guess what? Dave's, today is going to be his bar mitzvah. You know what the bar mitzvah is? When the boys are 13, yeah. Why? This is the 13th year I'm coming to him. Everybody's left and applauded and stood up. But I, I said to myself, you see, you don't have to be a president. Stand up. Everybody got a standing ovation here. <laughs> Please. I'm too, I'm happy. I'm survived. I lost my wife. One day, we came home. She had a beautiful voice. People were begging her to go and record things. She didn't want it. She went to sing every place to ask her, but she didn't want to record nothing. One day, we walked in, organization, and she said, David, I don't feel good. Took her to the hospital. Three days later, she passed away. I lost her. But that's life. I do the best I can. So please... I'm working, I'm talking about it, half an hour. I get I don't get overtime, don't worry. <laughs> but please ask question. Thank you. <laughs> An applause. I'm gonna get a raise. Well, more your poor with more again. Yeah, wishful thinking. It goes without saying, you know, especially for those of you folks who were in the South Jersey area. David's Bell. So you can just picture, um, instead of sitting in front of a bunch of educators, sitting in, in front of a bunch of your students. Questions? Wait, wait, Dave, Dave says to the kids, if, if nobody raises their hand, you'll have to go back to class. <laughs> <laughs> yes? I was just wondering. Can you speak up a little bit louder, please? Yeah. Okay, you mentioned something. I'm going to show some slides. Okay. Yeah, go. What? Go what? Just press the button. Just keep going. Oh, just keep going? Yeah. Now, you see this picture? That's my mother and father. I never knew my mother. She passed away six. I knew it was six, but I just found out six weeks. She had four brothers. One daughter, she passed away. And if somebody asked me, what are you missing in life? I said, I, I missed one thing. I never knew my mother. This is my, wait a minute. It's my father. My father remarried. I didn't know, I didn't know my father. 
until I was eight years old. I met him the first time. This is my grandparents, my, my grandfather. It's me, the little boy. It's my uncle in the back there, in the Polish army. I've lived with them for eight years. Every morning, when I start, but for, I think I was three or four years old, he took me to the prayers in the morning to pray. Then he sent me to the public school. And after the public school, I went to the religious school. Education is the most important thing, he said. And I listened to him, and it is. That's my wife and me. Yeah, I looked like this a couple of years ago, but you know what happened. <laughs> Yeah, we had that. We were married for 54 years. We had disagreements because we were in business. And guess what? I know she was wrong. I always told her she was right. Why to aggravate? <laughs> There's a wedding picture where they took it when we got, you know, I needed the picture. That's my daughter here on the left. That's her husband. He passed away three years ago, and that's half of the family. That's not all of them. I don't bother them, and they don't bother me. <laughs> we get along fine. We come for birthdays. Once. The kids now are different than we were. They don't do it like this. They don't care about the grandparents. They have their own thing. Everybody has a phone. People don't talk to each other. They write to each other. At least they know how to spell. So that's my life story. Now you know about my family. Can you imagine? My father, I was eight years old, I went on vacation. My uncle, each uncle took me to, I, well, every year. And one day, I'm eight years old, my uncle said, David, somebody, a man wants to see you. A man walked in, and the guy said, the uncle said, that's the man. And guess what, the, this was my father, and said, hey, David, I'm your father. Now I would ask you, where were you for eight years, right? I didn't even know I have a father because my grandparents were so mad at that because of my mother, but he had married right away and he had, I had two daughters and a boy. And he said to me, David, why don't you come with me? Yeah, there's a mother there. You have two sisters and a brother. And my uncle said, I start crying. I want to go back to my Bobby. My grandma. And my uncle said, David, if you don't like it, you can always come back. You have a home. I went there for two years till the war broke out. And I was treated like an outsider. I don't want to go in details. So that's my life story. I, sometimes I said, why me? Anybody else, please. Hi. First, I want to tell you, you mentioned the word chutzpah a couple of times. My family and I, we love that word so much, we named our dog chutzpah. <laughs> so, just so you know. But now you know you speak Hebrew, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, speak up a little bit louder. Okay. Also, I wanted to know, you said you spoke four languages before you spoke English. What were the languages? I speak Polish, German. I, I spoke some Italian and French. I'm, I did it to him once. I was, I was Skyping to Italy. He said, stop English, English. <laughs> and to, in English now. I still have a problem with spelling. <laughs> Would you believe it? One thing I do every day, puzzles. With puzzles, I'm learning how to spell. Every morning, I do two puzzles. Doesn't make any difference where I go, what time. I'm still learning. Anybody else? Come on, don't be bashful. Yes. Getting your tattoo removed? No. Because there's always going to be somebody, it never happened. You want to see it? I show it. When the classes have time afterwards, they'll come up, they'll look, they'll have their pictures taken. He's, our survivors, especially Dave, you see imagine it? this. Still there. They're almost treated like rock stars. 
And the impact that our survivors have is amazing. We've had teachers call us two, three, four years later telling us stories about uh, their students uh, coming to them and saying, remember when Dave Tuck spoke to us? Well, that was three years ago. Yes, I know. Remember when he said, this is the impact. feel about the Nuremberg trials? What did, did you know about the Nuremberg trials? Did you think anything about them? After the war. No, I tell you what, I had to make a living. I lived through it, so it, leave it to somebody else to think about it. I know about it. I know the whole story. Yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. Uh, what did you do for a living when you came to America? First, they put me in the men's clothing factory. I worked, they gave me six months for rent and six months for food. I paid forty dollars at that time for one room at the gentleman's house. I lived there. Eventually, my wife became the cook for him too. He was single. I lived there, and I paid forty dollars at that time for a month rent. In the beginning, I could only afford a just. This was popular for me in Europe. They call it Jewish penicillin. Chicken soup, pasta, bread, and chicken soup. Some food I could afford that. So, but after two years, I, I when I lived with my grandparents across the hallway, there was a boy there. I came there and I, I saw him there. He said, "Dave, what are you sitting over there in the factory? Come with me. I'm an interior decorator." He came after survived. His family was New York, big decorators. I worked with him. And two years later, he said, what are you rushing? What, are you going to business for yourself? I, think, I said to myself, what are you worried? It's America, it's so big. What are you worried? He was worried for you know, competition. Guess what? Two years later, I opened my, my store in the Bronx. I lived in Brooklyn at that time. Dave's French interior decorator. That's chutzpah, right? <laughs> and I did it for 32 years. We were in business later on. We opened a big store. She was telling dress goods. At that time, people were sewing a lot. Now they don't sew too much. Everybody's already made. Yeah. She was taking care of this. And I take myself, and uh, I'm not complaining. I'm still here. As long as I'm alive, I'm going to continue talking, educating the people. Do you ever keep in contact with anybody at any of the camps? No. A lot of them, I don't know if they're still around. And uh, what do we have to, I, they're going to tell me stories how they went through it. I don't want to hear it. There's some people do it. I said, don't tell me. I went through it. What do you have to tell me? What, are you going to cry for me? Too bad. I'm crying all my life. Most of our survivors will say that they really didn't have any relationships with other people in the camp because we're just focused on surviving and make a friend and tomorrow they're gone. So, just focus on and if they could, if I had the piece of bread, I used to put it during the night. Sometimes put it behind my shirt. I forgot to eat it because I was tired. If they knew what this there, they would take it for me. There were times in winter time, it was cold. I used to bring paper from the factory, wrap my feet. To, and if we had, used to have, they ever heard copper? The policemen, the prisoners too. If they were clean, if they saw me in paper wrapped around, they would beat, them. beat me. I got hit. One time I got beaten. But I'm with, two weeks before the liberation, I was sitting in a cockpit building the planes, the Stukas. I was working. There was a couple, you know, one of the policemen. He took a, I was glad they was a, a tube. I was sitting and working. Suddenly somebody hit me in the head here. I still have a mark here. I thought he was going to kill him two weeks before the liberation. Guess what happened to this couple? They killed him. Killed him right away. They, they thought they, well, they owned the place. Survive. See, it's easy to ask questions, you see. To survive, you had to be physically strong, you had to be mentally strong, and you had to be damn lucky.
when did you when did you begin to have fear when they put the yellow armband on you when they put you onto the at that, I, t- I was scared, but at that time, as a young boy, I didn't, I didn't know what's, what's, what's going to happen. I didn't. I, I should have was scared. I saw policemen. I was scared. You know, I know they were beating up, killing everybody. So, you forgot that when you were kids. Would you have wanted to know, as a 10 or 12 year old boy, would you have wanted to know what was in store for you? No. Or would you not? No. Right. Then you would live with, with scared. You wouldn't be living with hate, but as a kid, you don't know about hate. It's scared. Should I was scared? There was a night I told you. I went to sleep. I said, please, God, let me see the light the next day. I wanted to live. Because I had never left. I had, I had no mother, no father, nothing. And I was picked, why me? Because I'm Jewish? Of course, there were 5 million non-Jews killed in the camps as well. Uh, 1,300 priests, homosexuals, Roma, okay. political opponents. Okay, yeah, that was it. Yep. Something. Talk about, you know, praying to God, I hope I live another day. Did you remember, like Psalms and some don't? Yes. How can I prove it now? I, I live through it. I, I have a lot of people don't. I don't care. I always ask God, please let me see the light the next day. And I told you before, you remember? But the people saying, I'll never forget, never forgive. I said, well, God will forgive me. That's all I'm alive. I don't care what anybody does. I'm not in politics. I'm an American. I don't care about politics a dirty business. Don't go in politics. People are going to hate you. <laughs> Anybody else? I hope you learned something. I'm, before I finish, I'm going to read you something. How much time do we have? have three minutes. Three minutes? Three minutes. I'm Jewish. Make it five. Okay. <laughs> in the presence of in the presence of ice, which witnessed the slaughter, which saw the oppression that the heart could not bear. As has witnessed the heart that once taught compassion until the day came to pass. I crush you, my feeling. I have taken a note to remember it all, to remember to the last generation. When degradation shall cease, to rest to its ending. When the road of destruction shall have come to conclusion, a note, not the vein passed over the night of terror, a note, no morning shall see me the flesh parts again, a note, Less from this, we learned nothing. Thank you. Thank you, God bless you. Thank you. And do me a favor. Invite me. I have to make a living. Invite me to your schools. <laughs> I'm going to leave cards up here for you to take with our contact information and a few of our brochures as well. So I also want you to know that everybody here is hooked into um, this this and people are commenting in from this room on how they feel about today about how, how they feel about hearing you and what you have to say so these are what people are thinking in their minds right now um, listening to you so thank you so much for coming Wait, no, come. listen I have a book out oh, he has a book. <laughs> it's on the internet I was on Facebook guess what when this book came out, 11,600,000 read the book. We can, where, we can buy it online? Yeah, if you want, yeah, you can buy it or something if you wanted to. The schools can, anybody get together and They're call available. up the office. They're available with these car, from these cards? Yep. Okay, yeah. so you can take a card. 
So um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, David. And um, thanks for coming today again. Um, so let's just give David a